Hi everyone, this week we are interested in the water microbiome, an intricate e ecosystem that teems with life and covers over 70% of our planet's surface. Oceans, seas, lakes, rivers, and even underground aquifers are home to a large diversity of microbial communities that collectively form the water microbiome. Within the ocean alone, an estimated 80% of life on Earth resides, from the tiniest bacteria to the largest whales. And the diverse, eco, the diverse organisms in our waters um, influence global nutrient cycles, uh, as well as resources like energy and minerals. And the bi-directional link between humans and water systems is really important in, um, in helping us to preserve the delicate balance of marine ecosystems and to ensure that we're improving our own health as well. We must understand and preserve uh, this very resilient yet also vulnerable ecosystem that is the water microbiome. So in this talk, we're going to go over a few important areas of current research uh, in, um, in how we interface with uh, water. Um, in drinking water, in pollution, and water treatment challenges, and the ecological significance of the uh, of the water microbiome. Microbial diversity in aquatic ecosystems not only sustains aquatic life, but also influences uh, it influences global biogeochemical bio cycles. We talked a bit about this with our guest lecturer, Dr. Krishna, earlier in the semester. The water microbiome plays a very crucial role in balance in our ecosystem. Microbes reflect the impacts of human activities, climate variability, and pollution. They drive biogeochemical processes across our planet. And there are a lot of grand challenges surrounding the water microbiome. In the ocean, microbial communities are dominant drivers and form the basis of a food web fueled by fixation of carbon dioxide by oxygenic photosynthesis. Uh, and something uh, that I wanted to call to your attention is this great website of um, uh, a collection of researchers who collaborate in multinational projects, including Terra Oceans and Shrek, and they've systematically collected um, samples from all of the major oceans. And they're very interested in what drives microbial diversity across our planet. They have found that temperature is a strong driver of microbial composition, and they continue to ask questions related to how microbial communities adjust to climate change at a global scale. They, um, their results suggest that uh, Arctic waters, changes in Arctic waters are probably what would most significantly impact microbial activity as the rate of seawater warming is, uh, is exceptionally high in these areas. Of course, uh, there is a very strong link between humans and waters. And I wanted to call to your attention a, a really it was kind of fascinating to me that this hasn't been an area of active investigation, but the American Gut Project has recently revealed that drinking water is actually one of the major drivers of human microbiome composition. And it is, it is really understudied. Uh, I have included in the module a link to an article, and here on the right is um, is is uh, is an original figure from that article where they compared people who uh, were low water drinkers to high water drinkers, and the way that we can interpret this is the darker red colors with log two fold change, meaning that there's an increased abundance of these bacteria in people with low. Uh, uh, in, in people who are low water drinkers compared to those who are high. And inversely, those with the cooler or the blue colors uh, are more abundant in those who drink more water. And what we see here is that there is uh, 
significant increase in the abundance of Campylobacter, actually, in people who are low water drinkers, as well as Fusobacterium. Inversely, in those who are high water drinkers, there's more abundance of Lactococcus, for instance, um, as well as Erysipelo trichaceae, which is very interesting for its role in, um, in, in, in lipids and fatty acids as well. On the right, we also see that the uh, researchers looked at different sources of water, city versus filtered, bottled versus city, filtered versus well, et cetera. And the way that you would interpret this, again, is the first group that's listed is the comparative, so they're in the numerator, and the second group that's listed would be in the denominator. So if there's a positive log two-fold change, the, uh, the bacterium would be more abundant in the group that is listed first. So those with who drink bottled water compared to filter have higher levels of Fusobacterium and Campylobacter, as well as um, Fusobacterium in those who drink from bottled, uh, drink bottled water compared to those who drink from uh, well sources. And so uh, that's how we would um, interpret this graph from Venecki et al. And this was, again, published very recently, which was surprising to me that the um, that drinking water has not been extensively studied as a source of microbiome diversity and colonization. So these findings in over 3,000 people from the United States and the UK showed how drinking different um, drinking from different water sources can lead to differences in the gut microbiome. Also, uh, if a person drank well water, there was higher diversity, which is important to note. And the, the water source was among the key factors that explained variation. Uh, they looked at this with Bray Curtis, um, uh, Bray, Bray Curtis as their diversity analysis. Also from the American Gut Project, um, they, were adju they adjusted their analysis for age, sex, BMI, level of education, all sorts of things, also including diet type and how many plants were consumed per week, sugar and alcohol consumption, um, the list goes on. So this is a really interesting paper that I encourage you to read. Another thing that I wanted to note about this bi-directional link between humans and waters, an example from the literature relates to mountaintop mining, where researchers from Duke University found that even at the lowest levels of disruption, um, as, as defined by the EPA's reference point, uh, aquatic biodiversity is reduced significantly by at least 40%. And Emily Bernhardt from, um, and, and Dr. Bernhardt from Duke had said that one, by the time you get to the EPA's reference point, you've already lost most of the species you are going to lose. This is another important um, paper for you to consider the effects of, uh, of, of our urbanization, industrialization on uh, these vital ecosystems. Uh, the team used a, a method that might be interesting to some of you called environmental DNA, eDNA, and this measures genetic material that's left behind in the environment. They studied rivers of Appalachia, which are known to be some of the most diverse freshwater ecosystems um, in the temperate zone. And throughout the central Appalachian ecoregion, there's a lot of coal mining that raises pH, salinity, and this has effects in downstream waters. These were the effects that, um, that this particular investigation covered, sampling from 93 different streams in West Virginia, spanning coal mining intensity and uh, um, uh, uh, demonstrating some very strong effects of how land use, even when it reaches the appropriate classifications by the Environmental Protection Agency, they are still very consequential and have a significant impact on aquatic um, biodiversity. 
On the left is a photograph that I took recently on an outing with my daughter to a touch tank at a local aquarium on the coast of North Carolina. Just a reminder that something as simple as um, as our use of, of plastic bags, those who are cigarette smokers and might be, um, might be prone to just toss cigarette butts after they're uh, done using them. Uh, we learned that cigarette butts actually contain plastic and nearly 5 trillion butts are tossed each year. 65% of these are littered, which um, relates to 2.3 million per minute. Uh, this is what's listed on the right on the cardboard. And about one in every 10 of these reach the water. So as we uh, learned in our bioremediation and pollution module, thinking about the consequences of our of our waste on my on ecosystems around the planet, our overuse of plastic microplastics is very problematic. Are you aware of some very interesting research that has come out about ocean microbial communities? This is a work out of the same lab that I had referenced earlier. Uh, where they've taken over a thousand different publicly available metagenomes across 215 sites across the globe. And they've grouped these into different species representing over 8,300 different species, um, half of which were not characterized before. And they group genomic fragments um, based on how um, how abundant they were in different numbers of samples. And uh, they describe in the paper that this was very computationally intensive, but it helped them a lot in their reconstruction efforts. Uh, in the paper, they describe uh, several new pathways, enzymes, and natural products that they were able to recover from metagenomes. Uh, they've also made all of these resources available to the scientific community at the website that I've indicated here, uh, further facilitating research and providing a lot of very interesting fodder for biosynthetic potential from our global ocean microbiome. This may be of interest to many of you in our class. And um, finally, there are some uh, really nice articles in the conversation. Um, I've listed two here that I'd like for you to, uh, to consider as required reading. Um, microscopic life in our oceans produce up to 50% of the world's oxygen. So uh, obviously it's really important that we do what we can to, uh, to preserve the natural world. Uh, the first article that's listed on the left is quite interesting. This is from a group that, um, this was an Australian research vessel, vessel that was sailed for 63 days, starting from Antarctica and going to the South Pacific. And they collected a, a close to 400 different water samples. Their goal was to look into how microorganisms can, um, uh, how these microorganisms might provide more information into functional diversity. So again, this concept of metagenomics. And um, these microorganisms play very crucial roles in biogeochemical processes such as sulfur, iron, phosphorus, carbon, and nitrogen, just, just for a few. Uh, global research initiatives include GoShip and GeoTraces, and they've done a lot of expeditions for decades measuring things like nutrients and trace metals and salinity and temperature. However, the push for uh, these biological variables such as bacterial genes is has only been quite recent. And so that's why this research and that's why this, this particular group is so important. Um, and their question is, who does what in the ocean, right? So they wanted to see how the functions change from the Antarctic to the equator, and they want to link genetic code from bacteria derived from the ocean to various functions and tasks that they're capable of. And these include taking carbon dioxide dioxide from the atmosphere, uh, facilitating growth of bacteria, um, resiliency and coping with limited uh, nutrients, and breaking down organic matter, which has great consequences for our, our humanity as well. 
And the second link relates to antimicrobial resistance, uh, especially driven by medical and industrial waste and how we can be part of a solution, especially with antimicrobial stewardship. And so now that we're wrapping up, something that I wanted you to be aware of, um, as you can imagine, sharks come into contact with a lot of nasty bacteria and nasty things, especially um, bull sharks, for instance, who are able to swim into uh, rivers and very close to different cities. And so what um, a team of researchers has found is that um, there are special properties of denticles, uh, these, these structures on the surface of the skin of a shark that can deter attachment of bacteria. And this is related to the surface roughness. And it actually inhibits the formation of biofilms. This is really important because it could provide clues into new um, properties, new materials that we could use, especially in areas where we believe there is um, high potential for antimicrobial resistance. So this is a, this is a very exciting discovery that, um, that could provide another application for how we can use something clever in design from the natural world to, uh, to, to help us solve some pretty important problems. So this is a very interesting paper again, where they look at surface topography and how this affects different properties that can, um, that can, that can control the formation of biofilms. And I will include the link to that in our, um, in our Canvas module. So in conclusion, there's a lot here that we haven't covered. These are just microbiome curiosities in the water microbiome space that I wanted to present to you for you to think about as you continue reading about these areas. Uh, understanding the microbiome is essential for preserving water quality, human health, and, and ensuring the sustainability of aquatic ecosystems. Thank you so much for your time, and I hope that you um, enjoy reading the required materials this week and uh, that you post to the course if you have any questions or other exciting discoveries in this area that you'd like to share. Thank you.